Hello, my name is Tim Turnham. I'm the executive director of the Melanoma Research Foundation. Melanoma is the deadliest form of skin cancer. And like all cancers, it's something that shouldn't happen. Cancer occurs when a lot of things go wrong. Cells that shouldn't be growing are growing out of control. Cells that should self-destruct because they become damaged do not self-destruct. And perhaps most importantly, these cells are able to escape the natural system in the body that is designed to get rid of bad cells, the immune system. This is the same system that helps us fight off infection. For years, doctors and researchers have held the dream that somehow we could re-engage the immune system, the body's own natural defenses to attack cancer. And this could be an amazing impact in the cancer field. Progress has been slow, but signs of promise have existed for many, many years. Now things are accelerating. Things are changing quickly. And a group of doctors and researchers who have come together several years ago to study immunotherapy in cancer, a group called the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer, have recently released guidelines available to doctors across the country and even around the world on how to use immunotherapy in fighting these deadly diseases. We're very fortunate to be joined here today by three world leaders in the field of immunotherapy of cancer. First to my left is Dr. Howard Kaufman. Dr. Kaufman is the director of the cancer program at Rush University and assistant dean at Rush University in Chicago. We have Dr. Michael Atkins, who's the deputy director of the Georgetown Lombardi Cancer Center. And then on my far left, we have Dr. John Kirkwood, who is a professor of medicine and translational science and the director of the Melanoma and Skin Cancer Program at the University of Pittsburgh. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Pleasure. Dr. Kaufman, we'll start with you. You're a vice president of this group called SITSI and been involved in immunotherapy for some time. Perhaps you could tell us what is immunotherapy? Why is it important? Help us understand this. Sure, thanks, Tim. So immunotherapy is a treatment that really differs from other standard therapies that we have for cancer. So a lot of the standard treatments really go directly to the cancer itself. So that can be surgery where you can go in and remove the cancer, you can radiate the cancer, or you can give chemotherapy or targeted therapy drugs that go directly to the tumor cells and try to kill them. When that doesn't work, um, immunotherapy can come into play, and this is a little bit of a different approach. In this approach, we seek not to go to the tumor cells directly, but rather to the immune system to try to activate that system and get that system to go in and then recognize um, or identify cancer cells and then to kill them. And we've had good evidence that this is possible, particularly in uh, melanoma. Uh, this is a disease that's been known for a long time to be highly sensitive to immunologic attack, and we don't really understand why this doesn't work in patients who have more advanced melanomas, but many of the drugs that have been developed are designed to really boost that response and to uh, uh, then uh, eradicate the tumor uh, through the use of the immune therapies in the immune system. So one of the things that really prompted the guidelines to be developed was that a number of expert centers exist that give immunotherapy, but many oncologists did not train at these centers, they're not really aware of how to do immunotherapy, and so we realize that some patients may not really get access to the immunotherapy agents, some doctors may not really know how best to give them, and really needed some, some practical uh, help in understanding who are the right patients for this treatment, how should they give it, when should they give it, when should they stop giving it, and, and how can it be given in combination or sequences. And so we really sought to get together and get the best minds in the world together to really develop a set of what we thought would be useful guidelines for the practicing oncologist to treat patients who have uh, melanoma. Part of the process of the guideline development was we, we utilized the Institute of Medicine's guidelines on writing clinical guidelines. And so we put together an expert group of um, physicians, scientists, we included all stakeholders, so this included nurses who had experience uh, in melanoma. We actually had patient and patient advocacy representatives as part of the panel group that got together. We disclosed all of the conflict of interest, and uh, these were developed through the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer to really avoid any bias from uh, the corporate uh, world. 
I think um, for patients who are dealing with melanoma, immunotherapy remains an excellent option, and it's something that they need to ask their doctor about. It's, it's not necessarily for everyone, um, and there are times when immunotherapy may not be the right thing to do as part of the treatment plan, and so it does require careful consultation with uh, experts uh, in the field. Uh, I think the purpose of today is to go through and discuss some of the options that are available, how we as physicians make those decisions, and uh, hopefully get some information to patients who might be interested in this as an option for their, their care. So I just want a quick follow-up question, Dr. Kaufman. You talk about immunotherapy as an option for care. I think mm -hmm. in the cancer world, for patients and in the general world, we hear a lot about chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So this is not chemotherapy. It, it, it's different from chemotherapy, and, and how is it different? Yeah. So I like to think of, of um, uh, that we have really three major areas of treatment for patients, particularly with advanced disease. One of those is chemotherapy. We do have a chemotherapy drug that's approved. Uh, it's called the Carbazine, or DTIC is the other name that we call it. Um, this was approved back in the 1970s. Um, we, we tend not to necessarily use it up front because of uh, the durability of responses somewhat limited with chemotherapy. Another area we have is what is called targeted therapy, and this is a little bit different. So this is based on really understanding some of the abnormal proteins inside the melanoma cells that are actually turning them into cancer cells. And there are now a number of agents that are um, small molecule inhibitors. So these are generally oral agents, and they will block these pathways. And that's shown um, tremendous promise in recent years. And we now have three of these drugs that have been approved either alone or in combination, and, and we're, we're quite excited about some others that are on the horizon. Um, a big problem with the targeted therapies has been that they often will give us dramatic responses, but they don't necessarily last for a very long time. And so I, I like to tell my patients it's kind of like antibiotics. At some point, you can become resistant to them, and then the antibiotic no longer works. And targeted therapies also may have a limited time period in which they work, um, and then you need to try something else. Immunotherapy would be the third category that we go into, and that is using agents that boost the immune response. Um, right now, we have several of those approved. Interferon is approved for patients with stage three melanoma, and for stage four, we have high-dose interleukin-2 and ipilimumab, or your boy. Okay, and, and Dr. Atkins, we, you're hearing a lot about immunotherapy and cancer these days, and, and uh, Dr. Kaufman mentioned some drugs that are approved, but there are a number of things being explored in the clinical trial setting. So, so what is the field looking like, and, and where is it going? Well, let me just walk you through a little bit of the history of Great. immunotherapy in, in melanoma to sort of set the stage for, for mm -hmm. those comments. So melanoma has long been considered an immune responsive tumor. We've seen patients whose primary tumors have spontaneously regressed and occasionally when something is tweaking the immune system, even a metastatic lesion may spontaneously go away. So that feeling that melanoma, as Dr. Kaufman said, could be an immune responsive tumor and the lack of really effective other therapies for melanoma prompted melanoma to be a prime target for early immunotherapy strategies. The first immunotherapies that were tested were involved proteins or what we call cytokines that were things that stimulated the immune system. The proteins were purified and using recombinant DNA technology, they were able to be expanded to large volumes so that we could give them to patients and drive the immune system forward in a way that was not possible physiologically. The first of those uh, cytokines to be tested in patients was interferon, and interferon did show tumor shrinkage in some patients with advanced melanoma, but it worked primarily in patients with small volume disease. That prompted it being studied in the adjuvant setting in patients who had high-risk disease that was resected and were at risk for recurrence. So these are, these are patients who had melanoma, they've had surgery, their melanoma has been surgically removed, but there's a concern that a recurrence will happen and they're treated with this drug to try to prevent that recurrence right. from happening. And in those okay. studies, um, many were led by Dr. Kirkwood through the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group where interferon was compared to patients who were just observed, mm -hmm. interferon was shown to decrease 
or delay relapse or prevent relapse in about a quarter of those patients who were at risk mm -hmm. and to prolong survival. Mm -hmm. This led to the approval of interferon in that stage two and three high risk setting uh, in 1996. Mm -hmm. Another cytokine that is probably a more potent uh, stimulator of the immune system was interleukin-2, which was shown to produce tumor shrinkage in about um, 16 to 20 percent of patients with advanced melanoma that had spread to distant sites. And one thing that was interesting is that those patients who had tumor shrinkage and their tumors did not grow for two to two and a half years, their tumors never grew and they were likely cured. This suggested not only that uh, interleukin-2 was effective therapy and it led to its approval for the treatment of patients with advanced melanoma in 1998, but also suggested that immunotherapy could produce durable responses in patients with melanoma. The trouble with interleukin-2 is it nonspecifically activated the immune system. It caused a lot of side effects that restricted its use to patients who had to be in very good shape and were treated at uh, centers um, that were experienced in uh, its administration and management mm -hmm. of the side effects. In addition, it tended to also activate other cells of the immune system that had the effect of dampening the immune response. And so in some patients, it really didn't produce a net positive effect. Mm -hmm. And so we knew we needed to develop more selective ways of activating the immune system. And the breakthrough came with the development or the understanding that there were certain proteins that regulated the immune response, what we call checkpoints. And inhibitors of those checkpoints, in particular the first one that was discovered was CTLA-4, could take the brakes off the immune system and allow the immune system to recognize and kill tumor cells. And the first drug tested to block CTLA-4 was ipilimumab, and that was shown in randomized trials to prolong patient survival and also to produce durable responses mm -hmm. in about 20 to 25 percent of patients. Unfortunately, it also took the breaks off the immune system in certain normal organs such as the skin leading to dermatitis, or the colon leading to colitis, or the liver leading to hepatitis, or the pituitary gland leading to something we called hypophysitis. And so uh, physicians using this drug needed special training, and they mm -hmm. need to be aware of these type of side effects in order to administer it safely. So the challenge has been you're doing good things and getting the immune system to attack the tumor but the immune system is running amok a little bit, and so you have these kind of autoimmune Reaction. things that happen. Okay. So that brings us to the, your question, which is the um, new things that are being studied. So an additional checkpoint has been identified that regulates immune cells called PD-1, mm -hmm. or program death mm -hmm. one. And tumor cells or inflamed tissues express the ligand for this receptor. PDL1. And when immune cells get into the tumor and see PDL1 on the surface of the tumor cells, they're shut off. It's sort of like barbed wire shutting off the immune system. And if you can give an antibody either against PD1 or PDL1 that blocks that interaction, you can restore immune function and do so selectively in the inflamed tissue or the tumor. So that was the theory, and in the current research, it looks like that may be true. Several of these antibodies are being tested in clinical trials and appear to produce tumor shrinkage in 20 to 50 percent of patients with advanced mm -hmm. melanoma, even patients who've had prior treatments. Um, and so I want, to be, I want to be clear. We caught what you said there. You're saying it may be as many as 50 percent, half of all patients, will respond to this kind of medication. That's what the preliminary studies are showing, and it's doing so with less activation of um, the immune system outside the tumor right. and therefore less of these immune-related toxicities. So when you have a treatment that can work that well and has less off-target effects, 
it becomes also an opportunity to combine this agent with other therapies, such as other checkpoint inhibitors or other immune stimulators, such as the cytokines like IL-2 and interferon, or potentially the molecularly targeted therapies that Dr. Kaufman was speaking mm -hmm. about. And those trials are now starting. One, in particular, the combination of ipilimumab, the CTLA-4 blocker, and the PD-1 blocker are sh uh, in preliminary results are showing some dramatic results with half of the patients showing rapid and deep tumor responses. So this is really an exciting time. We're unraveling the way in which tumors interact with the immune system, and we're able to now stimulate the immune system, tweak the immune system in a way that we can get the maximum potential out of immune therapy. Okay. So th this is actually this is very exciting news, I think, for patient community. And Dr. Kaufman, I want you to talk a little bit more about the guidelines, but I think before we do that, Dr. Cooker, if I, we could turn to you, I, I would like to hear from your perspective. You've been working in the melanoma space and in immunotherapy for a, a number of years. What, what do these new developments mean for patients? I know I hear excitement in the voice of the doctors and the researchers because they see th things changing, but what does it mean for patients and how they manage their care and, and, and what they can expect? I think it's a wonderful time for patients. It's a time when we've gone from one chemotherapy and one biologic to three molecularly targeted therapies that can, uh, even if transiently, significantly shrink the tumor, but now four immunotherapies that are FDA approved, a couple of them working in the adjuvant sphere to achieve perhaps a quarter of a, or a third of patients who will never relapse from their melanoma, who would have, without this treatment with the interferons, mm -hmm. have relapsed. And new agents, the CTLA-4 blocking antibodies that Dr. Atkins uh, mentioned, which are in trial for adjuvant treatment and may do even better than the interferons. Uh, so I think we're moving from an era of single agents to an era of combinations. We're moving from metastatic disease treatments, which have 10, 20, or 30 percent benefit, to adjuvant treatments, which may have 30, 40, or 50 percent, even perhaps a uh, cure for predictable groups of patients um, higher than that. So, so there's some anticipation that if we're talking about whether it's 15%, 20% of people responding, 50% of res people responding, that at some point we may be able to predict which ones will respond and make sure that people get the medicine that will actually help their tumor? Yeah, this is the area of biomarkers. It's an area of intense research, and I think it's an area where we expect there will be markers that tell mm -hmm. us whom to treat so that we don't treat 100 patients to have 10 or 15 or 20 who respond, but treat just the 10 or 15 or 20 who could respond. And I think we also have biomarkers that may predict the toxicity, the colitis that Dr. Mm -hmm. Atkins mentioned. And if we can just avoid treating those patients who are likely to get the colitis, we spare toxicity and further improve the therapeutic index. And then, then on the other hand, the flip side of that is, if a patient knows that they are likely to respond to a medicine, they may be willing to go through some of these toxicities and endure what could be a, a difficult treatment thing because there's high opportunity that they will be cured. Yeah. And so they have to walk through fire, but on the other side, there's real hope. Yeah. These will increase the risk-benefit ratio. They'll decrease the risk and improve the benefit if they work the way we hope they will to personalize applications of the immunotherapies the way we always have done for the molecular therapies. So we would not use a BRAF inhibitor in a patient who doesn't have the BRAF mutation. Right. We just don't know which the markers are for susceptibility to the immunotherapies to the precision that we do for the BRAF and the CKIT inhibitors. So, so we're in a period of change and hope, but also some uncertainty. So Dr. Kaufman, talk a little bit about these, uh, the SITSI, the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer, the SITSI guidelines, and, and, and what are these guidelines, and how will they help direct care? Mm -hmm. So again, these guidelines were really developed for the treating physician to help take care of patients and really understand when and how to use immunotherapy for their patients who are interested in that kind of treatment and for the physicians who feel that that would be good for their, their patients. And I think a, a number of very important points came out of the meetings that we had and that are in the guidelines. So first of all, um, they're not really designed to take the place of clinical 
standard of care or clinical judgment. So they have to be interpreted in the light that they are only there to really help guide um, your individual doctor and in how to take care of you and really provide some suggestions and some helpful hints for when and how to consider treatment options. But everybody's an individual, and so um, one size will not necessarily fit all. Um, so that's important to understand that before discussing it further. The second thing that I think is important in the guidelines is it became clear that you need many different kinds of doctors to help take care of you if you have melanoma. So in addition to the oncologist, we know it's really important to have a surgeon involved. Um, was a mi minority opinion, but there were some people <laughs> at the meeting who felt that surgery should be considered um, either before as a primary treatment of even advanced metastatic disease or after some of the therapies because sometimes the tumors will shrink but not completely and then you could add surgery in. And so you need to have a surgeon on your team who's familiar with really taking care of advanced melanoma patients. Secondly, you need a radiologist on your team. We have to do a workup. We have to understand where all the tumors are. And in particular, the brain is an important area that can really change how we would approach the patient. And so making sure that the brain gets imaged early is, is an important uh, part of this. And so that requires a, a specialist called a radiologist who actually looks at the imaging that we do in, in our patients. And very importantly is the pathologist. So we've already talked about some of the targeted therapies and Dr. Kirkwood mentioned biomarkers. These are things that we get by examining the tumor from the patient or sometimes the blood that's taken from a patient. And it's very important to have a pathologist who can take a look at that and understand what some of the molecular changes are because that may dictate uh, how therapy is given. And so we have to put all of this information together. Um, this is why medical school is so long uh, to train. <laughs> Um, and why I think we need some guidelines to help people as what you're hearing is we're at the very earliest stages of some really exciting work going on. Um, and so until we have good data to suggest that one treatment is better than another or one should be given first and one second, uh, these are just general principles to sort of help guide the patient and the, the treating oncologist um, for, for where to go. So it's, it's, we're in an interesting time, it seems to me. Dr. Kirkwood, you were involved uh, heavily in developing interferon and using interferon in, in melanoma. All of you have been involved in IL-2. Both of these are drugs that are now, uh, have been on the market for a number of years. Now we have a newer drug, the ipilimumab, which was approved in 2011. We're looking at these PD-1 drugs, which will probably be approved within you know, 2014, maybe 2015, they'll be approved. So a person comes to you and they're presented with melanoma, where do you start? Ha, ha, is there a role still for interferon and for IL-2? Is there, or, or do you move straight to the clinical trials, or, or do, you, do you work with IPI? How do you make this determination? I'll, I'll start with you, but I'm welcome to hear from all three of you. Well, I think, as Dr. Calvin mentioned, the fact that we have molecular markers of the tumor on the one hand that may tell us a patient has susceptibility or their tumor has susceptibility to BRAF inhibitors doesn't ipso facto mean that we need to start off with the BRAF inhibitors, mm -hmm. that we have an equally potent and alternative arm mm -hmm. of the immune system to modulate and that the immune system modulations may increasingly have durability that cannot be obtained by the molecular inhibitors of the tumor pathways is an important message. And I think, as you pointed, uh, Tim, the trials ought to be the quintessence, the uh, apex of our thought at the moment. And wherever there's a trial, often it will provide the best thinking of collective groups like CITC and the national cooperative groups to bring these therapies to patients mm -hmm. earlier and to achieve better goals at lesser toxicities. Other so, thoughts? Yes. So my approach whenever I'm seeing a patient with <clears throat> Uh, advanced melanoma is to think about is there a way I can make this disease go away and stay away and right now the only way that we can do that for sure in a subset of patients which we can't necessarily identify who they are <laughs> is with immune therapy mm -hmm. and outside of a trial I'm also thinking about trying to give the patient the most shots at getting benefit as possible. And so 
We know, for example, that um, ipilimumab can work in patients who've had prior IL-2, but we have very little data about how IL-2 works mm -hmm. in someone who's had prior ipilimumab. So outside of a trial, I would probably start if the patient was eligible and was at a center where they could safely administer IL-2 <coughs> with high-dose IL-2 in that patient and give them ipilimumab second line. And if they had a BRAF mutation or their or they were not felt to be candidates for IL-2 or immunotherapy because their disease was progressing too fast or for some other reason, then I would use uh, the molecularly targeted BRAF inhibitor. But every patient is different and every patient's goals are different and it requires mm -hmm. a physician or a team of physicians who are knowledgeable in the management of all different types of patients to have a conversation with the patient to decide what's the best approach for that individual patient and their family. So I, I'm, I, I hear you say for, for IL-2, interleukin-2, if, if they have access to a center where they can receive interleukin-2, and the same is true for clinical trials. Clinical trials are only available in some locations. So what about the patient who's in, in rural North Dakota mm -hmm. and, and the closest place where they can get to a trial or get IL-2 maybe hundreds of miles away and, and most of us can't afford to just take you know a, a week off several times a year to stay in a hotel or to stay in a hospital and do the travel and things like that. What, what about these patients? So Tim, that's exactly who these guidelines are really geared towards. So if you have a patient who is in a rural area and may not have access to high dose IL-2 or clinical trial, the question for the patient or the oncologist is when should I seek out that other center? Mm. Do I do it now or do I try this other therapy that I can get here and wait? And part of the thinking back when we had our panel discussion was that for IL-2 to be effective, we know patients have to be in pretty good shape. Um, a lot of times that means having not very rapid disease, not having disease in the brain, and that is the time to try interleukin-2, and so what we wanted the rural oncologist to know is now is the time up front to send the patient, and if that doesn't work, then they can come back and try some of the other therapies later. So that's where I think this can come into play. We recognize not everybody's going to have access to every treatment option, and clinical trials also can be highly dependent on where you're getting your care. So the idea is don't wait until things are desperate to send them to a a really strong center that does these kinds of things, but maybe start out first there, and then there are other things that can be done more locally. That's right. Okay. Yes. And and from a patient perspective, uh, how does a patient choose? I mean, I think um, a lot of patients spend less time and thought choosing their cancer doctor than they do their plumber, quite frankly. Um, even though the plumber is going to keep their floor from getting wet. The cancer doctor may keep them alive. Uh, how, how do patients figure this out? Because if you, you, do, do, you, do you do surgery before you do immunotherapy? Do you do targeted therapy before you do, do, you do chemotherapy? For a, for a patient who maybe has only heard the word melanoma, um, what are the resources that they can get to make sure that, that they're managing their care from their side as best they can? I think it may be worth mentioning that this is a multidisciplinary disease, mm. but it's also an incremental uh, set of advances that we're talking about. And that perhaps the greatest impact in the therapy of melanoma is with the very first physician who sees the patient. If that care in the beginning, that surgery, that initial pathology isn't done properly, the whole foundation for the rest of treatment isn't laid properly. Even at the other end of the disease spectrum, when you have brain metastasis, and in the past we thought there were no hopes, and now we know both stereotactic radiosurgery, focused radiation therapy, can completely control that disease. And those same BRAF inhibitors we were talking about before work equally well in the brain and outside of the brain. Mm -hmm. We have a multitude of new options that really demand the specialty care center, the experts uh, in the decisions at the very beginning, what to deploy in the care of these patients.
And I know in some cases, I'm sorry, I want to get back to, I want to let others answer this, but I know that in some cases a melanoma expert at a very strong melanoma center will work with a community oncologist, will see the patient, develop a treatment plan, and then collaborate with the person at the local level to manage that care locally within fewer visits back at the, the main melanoma center. Has that been your practice or you've seen this happen? Does that work? I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but I mean... I, 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 I think it certainly works at our center. We, all, we, we always like to work with the community oncologists if there's a, a particularly difficult uh, patient issue. Um, you know, I think melanoma is a bad disease. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we all know that and can agree on that. And when you have a bad disease, it really does require getting uh, specialty care. You need access to sometimes a larger group of doctors than you might be able to get close to home. And although we understand there are issues with insurance, there are issues with travel, um, there are some ways that you can really try to identify where the melanoma expertise is. Um, your local doctor, your local hospital can be resources and ask them where do they go when they, they have a particularly difficult you know, melanoma mm -hmm. issue or question. Um, there are cancer centers that are set up throughout the United States. In general, a lot of the uh, NCI designated cancer centers in particular really strive to bring all of the expertise together for patients and often these are centers that have good relationships with their communities and many of them have networks that they work with regularly. And then I think there are resources like the Melanoma Research Foundation, um, the American Cancer Society, the National Cancer Institute that really maintain a bank of um, information, access to uh, some of the experts in the field. The National Cancer Institute has a very nice uh, website with available clinical trials and you can really search them even by state to find out what studies might be going on close to home. It, it feels like we're in a time that we will begin to see different outcomes for melanoma patients who are seen with these latest evolving, developing treatments or the latest evolving iterations of treatments that may have been around for a while versus those who are not um, in a position to take, take a, a advantage of that. And I think these guidelines are designed hopefully to, to shrink that gap a little bit, but that gap seems very much to be in place and may actually, because of the rapid change, be growing. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Well, I think not every melanoma patient needs to be treated at a melanoma center, but with all of these different options out there, and many of them we tried to capture, in these guidelines, but with the treatments for melanoma changing practically every month and with opportunities for trying to sort out what's the best sequence to give treatments or how do we combine treatments, it behooves a patient with melanoma uh, to seek out a second opinion at an, a center that has experts and knows how to use these options to at least set up the course for their therapy, even if it's going to be administered by their local oncologist. You know, as Dr. Kirkwood mentioned a little bit earlier, it's an exciting time in melanoma right now. We have a lot of new drugs available. We don't have a lot of information about how best to combine them or sequence them. Um, but what I like to tell my patients is there are a lot of options. Um, not every drug will work in every patient. So you have to really prepare yourself that if this one doesn't work, once I find out it's not working for me, I need to move on and go to the next thing. And to not be disappointed or too frustrated that sometimes we have to try two or three or four things. And today we actually have three or four things or more um, that we can offer to patients. And so uh, we have to be able to do that and the patients have to keep in mind that these are the options. I think the guidelines bring all of those onto paper. They can be in front of the, the oncologist and they can go through all of the options that are there. And then it, it really um, does have to be individualized. I think we've all said that uh, for individual patients. So it's, it's hard to find a guideline that will fit everybody, but it's important to just keep what all of the options are. And then, you know, part of our job and, and part of uh, individual um, uh, physician's job is to really help patients put those in order and, and, and make some sense out of how best to proceed with their individual care. Uh, and please. Uh, I might add uh, or 
follow up on that to say that really this should empower patients, uh, these guidelines should empower patients to really have the physician who is treating them structure out how the molecular inhibitors of the tumor fit in with the immunotherapies and even to discuss the role of chemotherapy and of course surgery, radiotherapy and the older modalities because uh, what we don't want to do is to block access to some of the new approaches that may be available by doing things that in their order, in their sequence, mm -hmm. may make it impossible to gain the benefits of some of these new and particularly immune uh, therapies that have such promise. So uh, I think some patients are reluctant to seek out a second opinion because they're afraid their doctor will be mad at them, um, their doctor will feel like it's an insult to them. I, I, my experience in talking to particularly melanoma specialists is melanoma is a very collaborative field and, and there's no crystal clear hard fast rule of exactly what should happen and so it's normal to think that two really really good people might offer different treatment options both of which are equally valid and, and there's merit sometimes in getting a different perspective. Um, it would, would you agree with that or do well, you feel we're still I think there? the melanoma field is changing so quickly that even the melanoma experts sometimes have trouble keeping up with uh -huh. it. But a general oncologist who's treating patients with breast cancer and lung cancer and colon mm -hmm. cancer and th those represent the majority of their patients may have a hard time keeping up to date with exactly what is the option that should be given for a particular patient with melanoma. So in that setting, I think that it would be reasonable to get a second opinion mm -hmm. and the melanoma centers would likely communicate to the oncologist what their recommendations are and if it's something that could be offered in the community then and the patient wants to have it offered in the community then that would be a reasonable approach to take. I mean my experience sometimes is is that the community oncologist is actually grateful to have a second opinion or second input and I work with a lot of my local oncologists who call me about a patient and sometimes we, we will send the patient back and forth uh, sometimes they're better off treated at the big center and sometimes they are better off being treated close to home and we often can work that out and so I would say it's important to have an honest conversation with your doctor and ask them how, how comfortable are you with melanoma would you would you mind if I got a second opinion and sometimes they'll actually have somebody in mind for that second opinion and say yes I I, I like to work with Dr. Atkins mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. time and why don't you go see him and hear what he has to say and um, I, I think sometimes that can be good for both the patient and the physician. And, so, I think, and I think this is really our job. This is really our job to be available to our uh, community physicians. The 23 hospitals that uh, interact in the UPMC network um, call daily about patients, have no hesitations, and our job is to get the patient back to the um, hospitals in the community mm -hmm. because the quality of life for patients being treated in their own community is infinitely better right. than coming to any of the big cities where the referral centers mm -hmm. are. But I think um, as both Drs. Kaufman and Atkins have said, um, this is a field which is moving at warp speed now and we already see the next two accelerations uh, in 2014 and 15 when both the single agents and the combinations will require the involvement of people who focus only upon those agents. So I think we, we've heard a lot of good advice for patients today. Uh, one, that it is possible to engage the body's immune system to fight uh, cancer, and particularly melanoma. Uh, two, there are a number of different agents that, that make that possible. Um, three, the field is changing quickly, and it's important to stay on top of that field. I think uh, another good point is it is important, in, given all of the above, to make sure if you have metastatic disease particularly, you're seen by somebody who sees a lot of melanoma and is really up on all of this, at, at least as a second opinion at the, at the very least. And then um, that, that melanoma is really not about having a treatment, but having a treatment plan. Um, that it, it, some people will respond to the very first therapy and, and have a great response. But more likely, it will be a series of things that ultimately will have the best impact. So one more question, then we'll wrap up, um, and, and you've been very gracious with your time. So the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer, or SITSI, had an event that I attended not long ago, and they were selling these T-shirts. 
and the t-shirts uh, had on them the word cure, there I said it. And cure is a word that has not been part of the vocabulary for very many oncologists, uh, particularly in the area of melanoma, because as you said, melanoma is a nasty disease. Are we looking at a time when at least for a significant percentage of patients, cure is a real possibility? Well, you know, I think we, we have had some immunotherapy for a number of years. Uh, interferon and interleukin-2 have been around, and I, uh, we've all had some patients that we now have a good 10, 15 year experience with, and they're still alive and they're still with us with very advanced disease. So I think we can say that these patients have in fact been cured. Um, I think we would love to know why these patients do so well and why others don't, and I think we are getting better at that. And I, I think some of these newer agents are going to increase the pool. And our excitement for why I think we stay in, in, in this um, business is that the promise of immunotherapy is, in fact, in generating durable responses, which really means cure. Other thoughts? Well, I think it's important to point out that melanoma is a very curable cancer. Ninety percent of patients who have primary tumors that are caught early can be cured with surgery alone. And it's not, it's only the, once it's spread to distant sites where it has gotten the reputation of being a bad cancer. But the advances that have taken place, particularly in the last five years with new uh, targeted immunotherapies and molecularly targeted drugs has made it a very treatable cancer. But that's also created a challenge for figuring out what is the best way to treat each individual patient, and also a challenge for the research community to figure out how to use these therapies in general in the optimal way. I couldn't agree more. I think that this is a field where those treatments which we've talked about that apply to the top of the triangle of disease, metastatic disease, the previously lethal part of the spectrum of this disease, uh, we now see applicable to the adjuvant post-surgical arena where there is no apparent disease, but the treatments may work even better. And I think to uh, close this, the possibility that looking at the skin, screening for this disease, even before it's invasive, may allow us to cure or to improve the mortality figures by half is, I think, upon us. And I think we all owe it, our primary care physicians, our local practitioners owe it to look at their patients and patients need to feel empowered to say, look at my skin, because mm -hmm. if you catch this early, it is highly, highly curable. Thank you uh, for being here and being part of this and, and more than that for being leaders and moving this exciting field forward. I mean, we talk about it being an exciting time, about things evolving. Things don't evolve on their own. Uh, it, it evolves through a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice and some dead ends and some new opportunities. And all three of you have been involved in pushing this field forward. So thank you for that. Many, many, many people will owe their lives to the work that you've done. Um, so thank you for that, and thanks to all of you for joining us for this conversation. I hope you found it helpful and that if you are a patient, it will give you some guidance and, and, and some hope on managing your melanoma. If you need more information, uh, we have a lot of information available at the MRF website, which is simply melanoma.org. Again, thank you.